just like to welcome everybody, um, presenters and participants today, to the What's Working Well in Patient Experience webinar series. Um, those of you who don't know anything about PEN, just very briefly, we are an organization that was established in 2009 to recognize, share, and celebrate the best practice or the, the, the best things that were going on in, in patient experience with an overarching aim really to promote, stimulate, and accelerate uh, improvements. And I have to say, uh, I became involved with them four years ago, and it's been a real joy to be part of um, the Penn family. Um, and it's been really great to be able to um, see some of the great practice that's going on. Um, this series today, obviously that's, that's me, this series today, we're gonna cover firstly the welcome and introduction, um, I'm going to give us about five minutes on the launch of the Winning Principles Report um, that has really formed the basis of the webinar series today. Um, I'm going to introduce you then to Sue Lear of NHS Arden, who's going to cover a very interesting um, program, the Homeless Hospital Discharge Program. And then in a change to the, to the published um, speaker, we're going to have Andrew Cocaine who is of Captive Health, and he's going to talk to us about the Patient Connect and Staff Connect um, innovations. We will then have some questions, and if we may, um, I'd like to, if we can, leave questions to the end so that we can cover them all in, in one go at the end, if everybody's okay with that. So, let's talk about the... Um, the winning principles and the, the background to it very briefly. I mean, first of all, I, I have to say, we have to thank NHS IQ and PICA for making this whole series possible, both the report um, and the webinars. Um, without them, we wouldn't have been able to, uh, to even step forward from here. The winning principles um, really came from looking at the 2014 Penn National Awards finalists and looking really what made uh, a good, strong submission. Um, the submissions and the winners, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a moot point. Um, we had a series of 50 finalists at, at this year, and when we looked back, not just at the winners, but also at those who made the finals, um, there were some real key themes, some real key thoughts coming through as to what made these, these submissions um, such good examples of best practice. And when we actually you know, thought about that, um, the themes that were being evidenced were also the, the attributes of great practice in patient experience. Um, there were nine key themes evidenced over three broad categories. And I'll just very quickly run through those with you. Interestingly, you know, these, these kind of um, patient experience um, improvements here, come from a very wide range of organizations, a very wide range of settings and subjects. And they come from very simple ideas to complete organizational change programs. But I have to say, the years I've been working with it, it's often the simple things that prove the most compelling. So let's have a look at what those key themes were. Um, the first sort of overarching um, point was intention and outlook. And what do we mean by that? Well, first of all, passion and determination. Successful in, in it initiatives were driven by an individual or a team. And what came through really strongly and what comes through, I think, with the presentations, I think you'll see them in this series of webinars, is the real passion that the people have and the belief in what they're doing and their belief in the fact that they need to invest time and money to help bring about a change. The second within this broad overarching theme was broadening perspectives and what we saw there was really looking beyond your own situation I have to say it's a real bugbear of mine what I what I found because I don't come from an NHS or, or a healthcare background what I find is that there's quite a lot of people looking really at their own, only at their own specialisms and their own areas of concern so it was very interesting to find that within the um, submissions that, that came forward and came to the fore, it is those who look beyond their own situations and embrace what's going on elsewhere. You know, it is, it is so important to look across 
not just your, within the healthcare industry, but from outside the healthcare industry as well. You can learn and develop from a whole range of sources, and that came through quite clearly. Keeping it simple, always a favourite of mine, the KISS principle. Making initiatives easy for people to understand. Um, I think it's just that, that communication of being able to get across your ideas and thoughts. Because sometimes we can get quite um, taken up with, with very clinical or very technical language. And I think trying to take some of that out uh, and present it in more straightforward language um, actually came across as, as helping people to understand the principles and the thoughts. Organisational support was another key area. So culture, um, engagement across the board from top to bottom and back again, and the understanding that everybody has a role to play. All successful in initiatives are de delivered by teams. They may have been initiated by an, uh, an individual, but they, they're all teamwork that actually helps to make it happen. And a culture that encourages that is really important. Management is something that's come across time and time again. Um, senior level support, um, gaining that in an early stage of the project was really seen to be helping hugely with the success of, the, of, of any project. What we're saying here is that, you know, results are seen when improving patient experience is covered, is encouraged, supported and prioritised by management but not necessarily driven by management. Management support is key. The great initiatives often come from the front line. And that sort of links very strongly on to, to, to the leadership element itself. Clinical and senior management leadership, particularly in the form of empowering staff, really came across as one of the key things. Evidence and impact. I think without evidence, without showing how things, how things have improved and changed, projects often can, can get lost. Um, financial impact, very clear. You know, there's a wealth of evidence to support this, that positive patient experience pays dividends. It is very strongly, you know, to invest in patient experience is really to invest overall in, in saving money uh, within the NHS, which is a key theme we're all looking at at the moment. Building professional relationships, um, working in, in partnership, Partnerships help to spread the burden and they help to spread the word. We can learn from each other. And as I think I mentioned before, don't be afraid to look outside of the healthcare profession. Looking back um, over the years, I and mean, one of the key ones that came, comes forward is, is Alda Hayes uh, partnership with Everton Football Club, uh, one that you can all go back and look at it, uh, another time. So spread and sustainability. It's this final theme that our two case studies today particularly evidence. But one of the things we do look for, and one of the things that, that really makes uh, any project a real success, is the fact that you can sustain it and you can transfer it to, to other areas of, the, of, of your organisation and of other organisations. I think, as uh, Sandra mentioned earlier, if you'd like a copy of the report, um, it will be available on the, uh, on the website. Um, you will be able to get a, uh, access to that after this webinar. So, spread and sustainability, that's what we're going to look for. We have a slide here which, which mentions questions, but I really would like to leave those at the end of the session. So, without further ado, I will welcome our first speaker. Our first speaker is Sue Leah. Delighted to have her with us, her with us here today. She's from NHS Arden Commission and Support, and she's going to tell us about homeless hospital discharge. Over to you, Sue. Good afternoon. Um, just one correction. It's now NHS Arden and Greater East Midlands Commissioning Support Service. We've had a, a merger since um, these slides were prepared. Um, I work as part of the transformation team, and we support um, a range of projects, from single projects to sort of reconfiguration and more complex areas of change for CCGs, and we also work with providers and uh, local authorities, and we've been doing some work with the third sector, so a really interesting kind of uh, program of work that we have. So this particular project, so as I say, we're now Arden and Greater East Midlands Commissioning Support Team, and I'm one of the transformation partners. Um, homeless people are 
it's, uh, this project was around working with groups of patients with really complex needs. When they need hospital um, support, they use they're big users of health resources, and um, they're a really complex group of people to deal with because of their vulnerability. And there's some statistics here. It, it shows that um, homeless people are attending accident emergency up to six times more often than people with a home. We know that data shows us that this patient group is admitted to hospital four times more often and stay in hospital three times longer than the general population. Approximately 70% of, of homeless people are discharged from hospital without housing or care needs being fully addressed. Um, and some of that's around lack of training and resources for handling those specialist discharge requirements whilst people are in hospital. And it's really hard for clinicians having to discharge people back into homelessness. And we often find that we result in revolving door attendances at accident emergency departments. So these challenges were recognized in the Improving Hospital Admission and Discharge Report, which was published in May 2012. And following that report, the Department of Health launched a £10 million fund to tackle issues surrounding homeless discharge. And we put forward a joint bid with Midland Heart who are a, um, a social housing um, landlord, and Valley House and Serenians who are, um, they support homeless people in Coventry. So we embarked on this joint homeless hospital discharge program to try and improve outcomes for homeless people throughout Coventry and Warwickshire. And we have, there's different levels of need within Coventry and Warwickshire. It's a very mixed economy. We've got a very rural um, area in, um, in south and north Warwickshire, and the homelessness tends to be centred on places like Coventry, Leamington Spa, Stratford, and, and there is a proportion of homeless people in Warwick, and less in the rural uh, locality. So our combined object objective was to design and implement a scheme which would improve awareness and understanding of the needs of homeless people. We wanted to facilitate access to appropriate care, and we wanted to broker relationships between voluntary and local government organizations so that we could start to minimize this uh, re-attendance and revolving door behavior that we were seeing. Um, and we want, obviously, ultimately, we want to work for patients to ensure they're not discharged back into homelessness. So the approach we took was around working as a navigator broker approach. So what this means is that um, Midland Heart uh, had a member of staff who act as a navigator. They worked as part of the hospital discharge team, basing themselves in the hospital and proactively identifying homeless patients, taking referrals from within the discharge teams, and meeting with the patients when they were identified, either in A&E or on the wards, to sort of establish what their ongoing care needs would be. Outside of the hospital, there was a broker service, um, and what they would do is they would do the brokering of the services, so they have a wealth of knowledge of all the services that homeless people can tap into. They had access to some flexible funds, and they also knew about what housing support and what accommodation was available. So those two people working together really made the difference in identifying people quickly and then actually getting access into the right services to address people's health needs. As a result of this, we delivered some really positive outcomes. Um, what we found was that using the broker system freed up precious clinical time. We didn't have members of the discharge team standing, holding on to a phone, trying to navigate a raft of community services and being met with brick walls all the time. Um, it meant we identified people that were homeless earlier in their admission so that actually we could start planning for that discharge early rather than waiting until they had a discharge date and then trying to find services. So that obviously frees up bed days. M much more efficient, quicker, better planned discharges. 
and obviously if you're if you're discharging people back into services then there's less likelihood of that readmission the, the hospital staff were really positive about this service and we we're able to give patients kind of holistic advice on on the full range of services that were available to them and people were going home with support. And what we actually found was that there was a 48% reduction on emergency inpatient admissions in the six months following referral compared with the preceding six months. And the A&E attendances reduced by 38% following their, um, their discharge date. So is this a sustainable solution? Um, what we tried to do was to streamline the service to build expertise among a small group of hospital staff and we supported with them but with clear protocols and training. So we trained them to identify homelessness earlier, understand what the underlying issues were that led to somebody being homeless and start to dispel some of those myths around homelessness. What we were trying to do was to really embed skills and knowledge within the local hospital discharge teams to make it more sustainable as a solution going forward. And by developing the skill sets, not only are we building a better understanding of the help available, but we're reducing the amount of time spent by discharge teams trying to identify solutions from scratch. So instead of reinventing the wheel each time, we've built really strong links with a variety of voluntary organizations and providers who can then mobilize quickly to provide the support that's required. And this knowledge helps secure a safe discharge from hospital and reduces the likelihood of readmission. And it also makes sure that people are on the right pathway when they leave hospital. So we found really strong partnership work with the third sector organizations have been developed. And a, little, a case study here, um, this is what one of our um, clients told us. Um, Fiona was recently homeless after losing her place in a refuge due to a medical condition. She was angry and frustrated with the hospital staff. The broker met with Fiona and arranged accommodation for after her discharge and she's now accessing follow-up support and has been signposted to other organizations to help her road to reco recovery. So and, and that's a really positive story about what she said you know it's been really great um, the cat really went out of her way for me to begin with and now I've got my own key worker who's continuing the process and I think I have to like thank the hospital for that for getting the right person for the job so it's a really positive message and so in summary what we've managed to achieve is that we have improved outcomes for over 150 people in this vulnerable group of patients that get little specific attention by providing the patients with the right support, we found that we can achieve a huge impact on both their health and their social outcomes. And the approach is sustainable in the fact that it embeds the skills and knowledge into the discharge teams so they can continue the work once the, uh, once the navigator's not there. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, um, Sue. That, that, I certainly find that really interesting. And I, I have to say, I had the pleasure of reading the entire submission so that I know a lot of the, of, of the background as well. Um, it's a really interesting approach to a vulnerable uh, sector of the community. Mm. Um, and, and I have to say, I found some, there were some really interesting points came over there. I mean, the statistics at the beginning, um, I'm not sure I had quite realized um, quite yeah. how um, an important an impact this, this group has yeah. upon the healthcare. So to find a way of improving the experience for them is really great. And, and um, I think that's a really key point because I think it's really difficult as a clinician working in a hospital when you're faced with a patient that you've seen multiple times and you know that when you're discharging them that you're going to see them the next day or a week later because you're actually never solving their problem. You're just patching them up and sending them out again into homelessness. So actually to be able to do something positive is, is, has been really um, fulfilling for the staff involved. Yeah, it, it certainly looks, I mean, and the statistics you gave us at the end about the reduction in readmission um, and the, and the A&E yeah. attendance, really super outcomes that you've had there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it would be you know, good to um, have, a, have a deeper look at the kind of things that you're doing as well. So.
Yeah, so one of the things we have done following this is that we have done a follow-up study to see if those, um, since the end of the project, whether those um, statistics, whether those outcomes have been sustained, and we have recognized that there is still, in the people that went through the service, there has been a sustained reduction in the times that they're attending A&E and a reduction in their admissions compared to pre the project. That, that is absolutely fantastic. Mm. I mean, that, that, that is, you know, if you like, the, the benchmark, isn't it, of success, yeah. that, that it, it's an ongoing success. That's absolutely brilliant. Okay, I can. I mean, I can see a couple of questions starting to come through, and I've certainly got one for for the end of the session. Just, just to remind everybody, if you've got questions, drop them on the the chat or the Q and A. Um, but I'd just like to say a very big thank you, Sue. That was a really great presentation, um, and we will no doubt ask you a few questions at the end. Okay, so thank keep you. you hanging on for that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so we've heard of the very interesting um, hospital discharge programme and coming at it from a commissioning um, support point of view, um, at a different angle than perhaps you might have thought of. So now we are going to hear, not from Mary as it says on the, on the slide there, but in fact from Andrew Cocaine. Mary can't, unfortunately can't be here with us today, but um, Andrew's kindly stepped up to the plate. And he's going to tell us all about uh, the Patient Connect and Staff Connect app um, and how it's impacted across a number of NHS settings and how it um, has helped move patient experience forward. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I love these webinars. It's so convenient, so fantastic. Thank you very, very much to uh, Patient Experience Network and NHSIQ for organising us today. It's fantastic. Um, we are here today because we were shortlisted in the category of innov in the category innov innovative use of technology and social media. Um, that means that our peers, people like you on the call like what we do. They like something they saw in the proposal. That's how the Patient Experience Network uh, National Awards are judged, which is fantastic. It's a very, very um, uh, supportive network, and I'm sure you'll all agree. Um, I just want to apologize uh, for not being Mary McKenna. Um, Mary had to fly off out of the country today, so you have to put up with me instead. Um, we are a bunch of innovators and social entrepreneurs, people who try and make a difference in life, like you, like um, you know, the, everybody on this call and in this network. So over the co course of the last three or four years, we have built a system. It's an integrated suite of software. One half faces patients called Patient Connect. One half faces staff and it's called Staff Connect. We know that there are huge savings in the form of the one-less savings, better patients, less demand on the system, as well as in the form of unlocking the benefits of staff engagement, reduced turnover, reduced absenteeism, reduced costs of recruitment, agency staffing, etc. Put those two things together, build the organizational culture that Louise so helpfully focused on in her introduction, and you have a really positive spiral. That's what Patient Connect and Staff Connect are all about. So we called this talk Better Information, Better Care, Better Outcomes. And I'm just going to skirt over some of that theoretical background, some of the evidence base for why we do what we do. And this is going to be familiar to many. And if it's not, there's some references there on the slides. So. 5.5 million people in this country don't get the information they need at the point of diagnosis. 3.2 million people don't feel they have enough information to discuss, discuss their condition with their doctor. Some people would say that that's tantamount to neglect. In terms of care, we've seen in the past few years the structures of care really being reorganized around the patient to put the patient at the center of their care in response to the mid-staff inquiry and in documents like the five-year forward view. We know, as you do, 
that in order to get that right for every patient, every day, you need really robust systems and processes and staff training. It doesn't just happen. We need to organize that care. And the prize is great. So the evidence shows that informed patients are better patients in terms of clinical outcomes, in terms of quality of life, and in terms of their personal financial benefits as well. Additionally, enter the one less savings, better patients and better informed patients cost the system less money. So we have a white paper on this that explores this evidence base. It's co-written between myself and Mark Duman, who's the founder of the Patient Information Forum. And we have a dedicated webinar on this on 10th of November, same time as this one in a few weeks' time. You can find out more on our website. So what? We've talked about better information. We've talked about better care and structures of care. We've talked about better outcomes. So what did we do about it? Well, patient care is a journey. And we think of the journey through life with a long-term condition as a really useful analogy. So four or five years ago, I was a head of patient experience in the NHS. I've been an organizational development board helping make organizations better. I looked around and said, well, who is out there using new technologies to make that journey that little bit easier for patients? And this was the vision. These, these were the sort of questions I was asking. So it's a long and windy road. And that's my road. It's my journey. It's a personal journey. But it's going to have some common features. Okay. That point of referral will be common to everybody who's on that journey, but it happened at a different time a different conversation, different content. It's my referral. There might be, in a simple pathway, a moment of diagnosis and some treatment, discharge after that, etc. The road is long and windy. Let's just focus on those two steps or anchor points in that journey. What do I need to equip me along the way? Well, I might want to know what to ask my doctor before I go to the, to the diagnostic appointment. I might want some information about self-care after that. Now, those things are common to everybody on this journey, but the timing of those are very personal. Too soon, the self-care information, I'm not going to read it, I'm not going to access it, I don't want it, I don't want to know. Too late, it's no use to me. So we might need personalized packages of support that would be common to everybody on this journey, but the timing of which would be, would be personal to me. What about, what about the physical places that I visit? They're scary. You know, the day that you go to hospital for that test or for that treatment is one of the worst days of your life. So how do we make that more accessible? How do we use technology to improve that experience? So each of those settings are physical settings with a physical location. I can use new technologies to create a geolocation for those and trigger information and support, human, personal information and support, personal stories, personal messages, potentially access to support groups. I can do that as people walk through that door of that appointment, of that diagnostic setting or, that, or, or the place they're going to get treatment. Or I can do that on a schedule afterwards. And that support, that, that signposting, is going to be to human beings, real people who can help me, people who've been on this journey before me. Perhaps they're on the same road, just a little bit further along, but they can help me on my journey. And then patient feedback, something we spend a huge amount of time and effort on in the system. Patient feedback is, sits within that context. And I want to break those questionnaires up into bite-sized chunks. I want the questions about the diagnostic appointment, close to the diagnostic appointment. I want the questions about the treatment or the referral, close to the referral or close to the treatment, and so on and so forth. You get my point. So in order to do that, I need a system that can really understand where I'm at in the system, what pathway I'm on, what my physical experiences are, and can use those as triggers for the dissemination of complex information of all different types, including batteries of questions for my patient experience questionnaires to make them much more relevant and real and tangible. So that was the vision, and this is the reality. It's called Patient Connect, and 
the vision that we had, that I had as a head of patient experience four years ago, I stepped out the NHS and I made that vision a reality. And we've got clients, North Middlesex University Hospital, Ipswich, Mersey Care, Birmingham Women, CLCH, Community Acute Mental Health, who are benefiting from this technology. We have a really powerful survey editor built into that, unlimited surveys assigned to different people on different pathways at different points in their journeys in order to unlock those benefits of bringing the questionnaire closer to the true patient experience in order to understand that better. We're using the power of new technology, not as a data collation mechanism, but as a true platform or a user interface, a, a method, one among many methods of engagement between the trust, the provider organization, and the patient. We can increase accessibility and we can personalize the experience using this platform. So there are clear benefits. Reduce costs, reduce costs to the patient, better outcomes, the 30 billion of savings if we educate and inform, culture change, caring environment, etc. So the Penner judges liked this. They liked what they saw here. But this isn't it. This isn't all. We've turned that around to face staff as well as a staff engagement mechanism because we know that to make a difference to patients, you need a fully engaged and fully supported staff group, the right information at the right time when they need it. Think about the power of new technologies for a workforce where 75, 70, 65 percent of the workforce is not sitting at a computer every day. They don't have access to that, easy access to that information, the tools that they need for their job, the clinical pathways, the policies, the procedures. We can put all of that in their pockets securely as well as cascading all sorts of information, performance, uh, KPIs, all those sorts of things, the staff directory, etc. So I'm going to wrap up there and put it, over, put it out to questions. So I think it's really valuable to have that exchange and hear people's responses to the presentations that we've have, had. But before I do, I just wanted to say thank you. I say thank you to the judges because a lot of people give their time um, with no real reward other than the, being part, the reward of being part of fostering innovation and celebrating good practice. I want to say thank you to the Patient Experience Network team for organizing us, but particularly thank you to everybody who comes to these events and makes these events happen, be it a webinar like, like the one we're doing today or the event um, that we attended uh, back in the spring and I'm showing on the screen now. They're great days and I really urge everybody to continue to take part. Um, we were shortlisted in three categories this year. Um, Amy from Birmingham Women's is going to be speaking at a future uh, one of these events, so please come back and hear it from the horse's mouth from Birmingham Women's Hospital. This so for the Ipswich Hospital NHS Trust, we've got the Head of Organisational Development joining us for that session. The Captive Health is going to do a couple more webinars afterwards. Have a look at our website and feel free to book onto those if you want to give it your time. We've got some real experts and you will get the chance to hear from Mary on another day if you would like to do so. So thank you very much. You know where to find us and uh, look forward to taking some questions. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Um, again, another very interesting uh, presentation there, which has uh, really sort of helped to enlighten us about how new technology can help both patients and staff to, to connect and to um, ensure a better, better outcome. Um, I, I, I liked the journey analogy. That, that helped me. And, and it, interestingly, it, it took me back to one of the key findings of the report to keep it simple help to make sure that you can uh, make, I mean, I'm a, I'm a bit of a technophobe, so anything technology, my eyes usually glaze over. So it, to have that journey analogy really helped me to, to understand um, how this would help. So thank you very much indeed, um, Andrew, for stepping up to the plate and running us through the, um, the patient and staff connect app. Uh, I have a couple of questions here. Okay, well, I just have, I have one question each for, for Sue and Andrew. Um, shall I first start with Andrew, because he's, he still has the ball, so to speak. Um, I know that, Andrew, I know that there are going to be um, other people coming on in the future to give us um, their view from the horse's mouth, uh, as, you, as you mentioned. 
But could you just give us a quick, either one or two examples, just of, of, of where it's worked well, and just a couple of bullet points on how they, um, what sort of challenges the, the, the organisation has had and how they might have overcome them? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, I think, um, and you can you know, hear more from from others on on future events. But um, I mean, with we, the, the patient experience, um, patient feedback provider for Birmingham Women's Hospital, we've just collected our fifty thousandth instance of feedback last month, which is very pleasing. Um, so you know, all, all of that data going off to Unify in the normal way, etc. Um, and we 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 have some innovative tools for those people. So, you know, when you walk on site at Birmingham Women's Hospital, you get a welcome message on your smartphone that says hello. In fact, that says anything that the, 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 the client in that case, you know, Birmingham Women's wants it to say. It's all content managed through control panel. So that message can be changed at any time. When they leave, they get a goodbye message that says thank you and I hope you had a positive experience and, and includes a link to the feedback module and pushes them towards, um, you know, giving feedback and, and, and logging in and so on. Um, and that, that has a positive impact on response rates. So that's just one example of how, you know, you can use new technologies to, um, uh, to, to, to do some of the things we've always done in a slightly different way. It's not suitable for everybody, but for those people whom it is, they enjoy it and they use it well. Um, what are the barriers there? Well, some of this stuff cuts across silos. And in fact, if you look across the Staff Connect and the Patient Connect, um, we find the most, the, most ex the, the most positive projects, projects where the whole team is engaged. By the whole team, I mean across the execs, across the silos within the organization. So, you know, one of my favorite clients, a favorite of our clients, you know, the, the project leader is the deputy chief executive. He, you know, pulls people together in the steering group and, um, you know, we, together we make things happen. Um, so, you know, you'll need your comms team engaged. You'll need your HR people engaged. You'll need your patient experience people engaged. You'll need, um, you know, anybody who's, who's, who's got a, a view to performance and, and, and organizational change. Uh, but these things are fantastic, you know, these sorts of projects. You, know, you can do a whole set piece, you know, organizational project, or you could think about, you know, a, um, a, a microcosm of your organization. So one of our clients is Mersey Care NHS Trust. I think they may be entering um, for an award this coming year. Um, they've set up an online panel uh, of 10% um, of their staff. They call it, call it the Mersey Care 400. Um, 4,000 staff in the organization, mobile workforce, and they're using our technology as a way of really, as a, as a sounding board, a, a, an online panel. So the idea is that if those 400 people have been consulted about an organizational change or direction or strategy, et cetera, then I, I can assume that you know, even if I'm not part of that group, I can assume that it makes sense, and somebody like me has has had their say and has had has, has had a say on this. Um, at which point, I'm I'm more likely to um, to, to accept it as something that is uh, well thought through and positive for the organisation as a whole. So, a couple of examples there of people using this technology in in, in very creative ways. And um, you know, watch this space. Fingers crossed, uh, we'll we'll be able to support um, one of those back to 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 the event uh, next year and. Hopefully, um, so we, we, they can pick up an award. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. That was a lovely comprehensive answer. I think it's just given people a flavour of um, some of the organisations and some um, practical examples of, of how it's actually helped in there. So, I, I mean, I, I was, um, you know, as, as, a, as a practitioner and somebody who's been in the system for, for a long time, um, helping organisations, public sector organisations through change for the best part of 15 years, um, I was read, I was start, I was actually startled to read the you know the evidence base. The reason we've put this white paper out recently with Mark Jeeman, um around the benefits of patient information is is really because that that story simply isn't told enough. And and I think that um, you know there's a there's a real challenge with this stuff, isn't there? So you know we all wrestle with finding the right budget line in our organisation, helping you know getting the right people around the table, etc. And some of the benefits, the system benefits, they cut across the whole system and they affect lots of people in a small way and the benefits come down the line. So another challenge just in response to your question is around the, you know, there's there's no instant cashable saving for making some of these changes and we all know the pressures on, on NHS trusts at the moment. And I suppose one of the challenges is finding you know, inspirational leaders like the people we've got on the call today um, who can who can make some of these these innovative, um, you know, these, these, these innovations that have worked elsewhere uh, make them happen. 
And I guess I suppose I would urge people on the call, you know, who is it in my organisation that I can I can uh, I can bring on board or I can petition? Um, and you know, if I put a good enough evidence base in front of them, um, you know, they, they should really take that, uh, you know, take the bull by the horns and um, and try and do some of these more innovative things uh, that we see uh, producing really good results elsewhere in uh, across healthcare. Thanks, Andrew. And it is, you know, it is important. One of the things that that we we talk about a lot is is the importance of evidence and making it clear. So, so I just had a, a quick question for you, um, and it really goes back to that you're talking about partnerships. Yes. Um, and, and I'd be I'd be interesting to know how easy did you find it to find partners in the first place, and how did you go about bringing those them together and getting them um, online or on board? Right. So. For this particular piece of work, it was incredibly easy because it was a very targeted um, a, a, a bid that we had to put in. And because it was targeting a particular uh, cohort of, page, of people, um, there's, there are you know, people, there are organisations that are working in that field. So, and it had, the bid had to be uh, produced, co-produced and submitted by a third sector organisation. So it really was a joint partnership from the beginning. But we've been working with um, a company called the Young Foundation um, in doing a lot of engagement with third sector organisations. So we do have a kind of a pool, I guess, of, of third sector organisations that we can tap into now. So, so from our point of view, that, that wasn't a difficult point of view, but it's because, it's because we've made those links already. Um, one of the things that was really noticeable in this project was how much how much more agile the third sector organisations were in setting the project up and mobilising. Within the NHS, it's, we sometimes struggle with the mobilisation of things quickly, but the third sector organisations could do that much quicker. So that it was really it was fantastic working with them to see what could be done and how quickly they mobilised resources. That's fantastic, Sue. That, thank you for that insight. Um, I think sometimes when you think about pulling partnerships together, it, it can be a little bit daunting, particularly when you're looking outside your comfort zone. Yeah. Really. Yeah, and I think so, you know I think some of these third sector organisers are so agile. You know, they they can just because they don't have all the layers of bureaucracy and governance that we tend to go through as as traditional sort of health sector organisations. Yeah, I, I think we you you often find that with with other organisations, smaller organisations, yeah. don't you, that they can they can be more nimble. And it, and it, yeah. and there's learning points to to be to be had from both sides there, aren't there? outside yeah, the, the, the direct project. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there always needs to be some governance around the project, but um, we need to get appropriate governance. Yeah. There's okay. a challenge, isn't there? I mean, you, you know, you've got so Andrew here. So, so you've got um, innovation and, and evidence. So yeah. you need to create an environment where innovation can happen and things that you can try things out um, you, you need to evaluate and then you need to kill things off that don't work and try Absolutely. something else I think yeah. one of the wonderful things about working with third sector organizations they're very very good at collecting the evidence because their funding depends on the success of the outcome so that's that's a, it's a really you know if we're if we're smart about that and we don't have to take something on and, and do it across a whole system we can try it in a pocket evaluate it properly and then roll it out and I think you know, we we need to NHS organisations need to be much 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 better at you know picking winners, killing things off that don't work, and um, and and looking at the evidence base for for, for true sort of system wide innovation um, using forums like this one to, to to promote stuff when we really know that it works and the, that that you know most most of the people who who we who we who we work with in this system you know have a sciencey background and ought to be really good at evaluating evidence and, and we should you know we, we, we should make the most of that and, and get better at it and putting putting good business cases together for real innovation and that's what underpins the you know the whole national direction of our new care models isn't it you know we need to try things out do things a bit differently break the rules if we have to and then actually make them replicate the things that work replicate them across the system 
So I agree with you entirely. So we've had a question about um, from Jenny Shine about if 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 they wanted to use I don't know where Jenny's for which organisation she's from but if they wanted to use the the, the capsule technology um, how does it work and I just something I omitted from the conversation so so we we see ourselves as being at the centre of a network of, of public sector organisations who work entirely in healthcare entirely in in the, in the public sector healthcare. So we have a, um, we're an ethical company and we think of it that everybody makes a small contribution um, and everybody benefits from something they, they wouldn't be able to afford to do on their own. And that's very much our model. So we keep our costs down by having a single code base that's common to everybody. That means two things. It's, it's, it's more cost effective for us to maintain. Um, you know, per, designed for each organization, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a common suite of software. It's often software as a service format, which means that there's no IT footprint. It's very, very easy to, um, to, to implement. You don't have to go through sort of a lengthy process with your IT team. Um, and then as we publish upgrades, so iOS 9 has just come out, for example, on the app side, which is one side of what we do, you know, it's big online, online presence to what we do as well, not just on smartphones. But, you know, iOS 9 has just come out. Um, you know, we'll we'll develop a you know we'll develop the um, you know the, the the upgrade that's required for that. We'll push it out across the whole code base. Everybody benefits. There's no additional sort of charges, etc. It's all sort of part of the package. So um, really easy to really easy to implement in any trust um, designed for you. Um, and you know we're very we're very public spirited in in how we work. So we you know we're all ex public sector and people who and Mary who would have been speaking today got her MBE for saving the public sector 100 million pounds for innovation in five years. So you know that's that's very much the kind the kind of people we work with and and how we work. Okay, thank you, Andrew, and thank you for picking up on that question, which I which I just spotted and was was going to come to. So thank you for picking that up. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I mean, I just, there's just a lovely comment on here, which I think probably everybody can see, but it was just nice to pass on to the um, to the two presenters today, just to say it's great work and inspiring. Um, and I would have to um, I would have to support that. It, it certainly has been great work and inspiring to listen to both of you. If there are no more questions, and, I, and I'm not picking up that there are, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I would just like to say. Thank you very much to our two speakers, Sue and Andrew. I think you, you've done a great job today. Um, certainly helped me to understand more about um, the two projects that, that um, were identified. Um, and also to say thank you to those of you who, who attended today. I think it's, it's great to know that there are people out there who um, are interested in hearing uh, what's going on in improving patient experience. Also, to just remind you underneath there, there are the dates for the rest of the series. You'll be hearing from new speakers each time on new topics and new subjects, so it's always worth coming back and listening to a, to a future um, presentation. And I look forward to um, seeing and, and hearing from you all again uh, next week. <laughs>